Have you wondered how we run code blue on a patient with LVAD, an impeller, or a defibrillator, pacemaker, intraortic balloon pump, or maybe the patient is on dialysis when he lost his pulse, or maybe he's already on epinephrine drip, or he's actively bleeding, and other situations that a lot of us may get confused about what to do next. And remember the last things we need as code leaders is to be confused and not knowing what to do next. Hi everybody, this is Dr. Arrohamni from Hospitalista where we teach all the tricks, skills and the practical knowledge to be a great resident and future hospitalist. Last video, which I will put a link for down in the descriptions, we learn how to be a great code leader, how to run an efficient, smooth code and today I'm going to teach you how to be the most experienced code leader in your team. So let's not waste any time and go through these possible scenarios after this very short intro. And remember to tap that subscribe button and the notification bell if you have not done so, so you get to see our videos as soon as they are released. So this patient has LVAD, a left ventricular assisting device. These machines we use for end-stage heart failure patient as a bridge to transplant or as, as an indefinite therapy. These are continuous flow machine that pump the blood from the left ventricle into the aorta regardless of the heart cycle. And the word continuous flow means they are pulseless. These patients are walking, talking, pulseless at the baseline. So when they become unresponsive, how do we tell if they are in cardiac arrest or not? And the big questions here, the most important thing, do we need to do CPR or chest compression on these patients or not? Why? Because CPR and chest compression can dislodge the LVAD machine and then if the patient survived the event, he will need another surgery to reposition or replace the LVAD machine. So we have to put all the efforts and try everything before we decide to do CPR or try to avoid, let me put it this way, try to avoid CPR as uh, and chest compression as much as we can. So what do we do if the patient is pulseless? How do we tell? Here we rely on something else. We rely on what we call adequate perfusion size. We look at the skin color. Is the skin color is normal or pale? We look at the uh, capillary refills. Is it normal or very sluggish and slow? If there is good signs, the signs, there is signs of adequate perfusion, the skin color is normal, there is normal capillary refills, then we have to look for other causes of being unresponsive because at that point we can say it's not the heart, it's not the LVAD machine. And we look for example into is there hypoglycemia, hypoxia, hypercarbia, seizures, and follow the protocol for those etiologist. On the other hand, if we find there is poor perfusion size, uh, pale skin, very sluggish capillary refills, then the first thing we need to do is to check if the LVAD machine is functioning or not. Simply lean to the patient chest and listen to the hum sound of that machine. If you hear that hum sound, most likely the machine is functioning. Also look and listen for all the alarms of that machine. If the machine is not functioning, then immediately we should try to troubleshoot why and try to restart it as soon as possible. So if there is a family member, because LVAD center usually teach the patient and one of his family how to take care of the LVAD. If that family member is there, let him help us. Calling the LVAD coordinator immediately always very helpful because a lot of us are inexperienced in troubleshooting the problem. But it's important to look at if the drive line is connected, if the battery is dead, need to be replaced, the power source is connected, the system controller need to be as well replaced and at that point, if we failed, if we were able to restart, 
the LVAD machine simply check the perfusion size again we should be able to restore them and you can check blood pressure as well at that point if we fail to restart this LVAD machine or they were the LVAD was functioning even with the poor perfusion size so we checked there was inadequate perfusion size, pale skin, a slow capillary refills, and the LVAD machine was functioning or was not functioning and failed to restart. Then at that point, we need to check two things immediately. Blo uh, the mean arterial blood pressure, that's one, and the end tidal CO2 with capnography. If the mean arterial blood pressure uh, uh, was above 50 millimeter Hg and or the entire CO2 was above 20 millimeter Hg. At that point, then there is still no need to do CPR. Just follow the ACLS protocol. So see, we try to avoid CPR as much as we can. But if the mean arterial blood pressure was less than 50 millimeter Hg and or the entire CO2 was less than 20 millimeter Hg, and if the patient is intubated, we have to make sure it was correctly intubated to to be uh, to for this entitled CO2 to be reliable so map less than 50 and or entitled CO2 less than 20 then at that point we have really no other option except go ahead and do CPR and chest compression and take the risk of dislodging that LVAD machine it's okay also to shock this page these patients for a bad rhythm as long as everybody clear and remember last advice LVAD machines they like fluid boluses so they give them fluid boluses and by that time somebody should have got a hold of the LVAD coordinator and just follow their instructions because remember we don't have much experience with this machine but the advice I have here we don't rush for CPR like other causes and just compression we try to figure out if there is any other things we could fix Try to avoid this CPR. We have to go through these steps because remember, we're trying to save the machine of this patient. Impella basically is a short-term lift ventricular assisting device. And patients who require Impella usually are critically ill in cardiogenic shock, usually intubated, already have an arterial line. And this machine usually we use for two to three days, hoping the left ventricle will recover or improve and then remove these machines after that. Compared to traditional LVAT patient, these patients are, most of them, they do have a pulse. In rare occasions, sometimes the impeller machine take over completely, could completely take over the left ventricle and the patient become pulseless. But the rule of thumb, if they say the patient is pulseless, that means the patient is in cardiac arrest until proven otherwise. If you are in any doubt, if you have that portable echo, you can check immediately and see if there is any heart movement. But also you can look at the monitor in that patient room, look for the arterial line, which I made a video about, and I'll put a link on that in the, uh, for that on the, in the description. If the arterial line waveform is uh, flat, look at the impella monitor. There is, as you see here in the pictures, as you see here in the picture, there is this red waveform, which is the aortic pressure waveform, and there is the green one, uh, which is the pulsatile waveform. In cardiac arrest, all will become flat, once you decide the patient is in cardiac arrest, this should not take you more than a couple of seconds. Then immediately lower the flow rate of the impilla, which we call the p-value. Lower it to number two or three and start CPR and ACLS protocol like any other uh, ACLS protocol. You can shock this patient for bad rhythm as long as everybody's clear. Make sure nobody touch any part of the impilla device. As soon as spontaneous circulation restored, then you can go up on the flow rate or the p-value back to the previous level. So this patient has an ICD, an implanted defibrillator. Whenever there is a cardiac arrest with this patient, we follow ACLS protocol like usual, but we pay attention to the following points as a code leader. First, whoever doing CPR should wear gloves, because if there is a shock delivered to the patient, 
from this ICD while, while we're doing CPR, if we're not wearing gloves, we may feel a tingling sensation. It's unpleasant feeling. It doesn't pose any danger, but it's better to avoid it and simply just wear gloves. So that's the first thing. The second thing, of course, if the patients get a shock from the implanting defibrillator from the ICD, simply we see this muscle contraction, give 30 to 60 seconds after that before you deliver any external shock. So remember that, don't give an external shock immediately. Third, if we're going to give an external shock, make sure that the pads are placed a little bit far from the ICD itself so we don't interfere with its function and its programming. And fourth, use the lowest energy output possible for external defibrillation. And the last thing, remember, when we get this spontaneous, when we get a return of, of spontaneous circulation, circulation and the pulse is back, remember to interrogate the device as well. Otherwise, it's similar to any other case of cardiac arrest, just follow the ACLS protocol. So this patient has a pacemaker. So we just follow the ACLS protocol for cardiac arrest like any other patients. The only issue here, make sure that you interrogate the device after the return of spontaneous circulation. Remember, external defibrillation shocking these patients may cause a temporary battery voltage reduction, which would cause the device to enter a, res a reset condition. So we need to reprogram the device most likely. Usually it will display a warning message upon interrogation. Just simply make sure to call the representative of the company to come and interrogate and reprogram the device if needed. Now this patient has an IABP, an intra-aortic balloon pump. And if you're not familiar what that is, I made a video about IABP in my ICU crash course. So please watch that. I'll put a link to that video in the descriptions. But if this patient, these patient go into cardiac arrest, these patients are always having a pulse. So if they lose a pulse, that means they are in cardiac arrest you do not need to disconnect this device. So you can use a pressure trigger, you continue this machine and use the pressure trigger generated from the CPR and good compression. But if you are inexperienced, if you don't know how to do that, or everybody can use, just simply tell them to put it standby, finish your code, run it as usual. As soon as the spontaneous circulation restored and the patient has a pulse, immediately put it put this machine back to work because the longer stayed on standby, the higher the risk of thrombosis. So remember that. And remember, if you're gonna shock these patients, make sure everybody's clear, nobody touch any part of this machine. You do not, do to discon uh, you do not need to disconnect this machine. And simply, if you don't know what to do, just put it standby and do your ACLS, pr ACLS protocol as usual. So now this patient lost his or her pulse while getting CRRT, Continuous Renal Replacement Therapy. Also, if you're not familiar with that, I made a video in my ICU crash course on CRRT. I'll put a link for that video in the descriptions. But whether the patient on that CRRT or regular hemodialysis, if they lose the pulse, immediately stop dialysis. And the dialysis nurse, usually they will do that even before we arrive and then continue with ACLS protocol like usual. Then the decision to put them back on dialysis, that will leave it to the nephrologist. But if they are getting hemodialysis or continuous renal replacement therapy, when they lose their pulse, immediately disconnect them from those machine and continue with ACLS protocol as usual. Maybe your patient was already on epinephrine rep and now he's in cardiac arrest, maybe one of the people during the course, hey, the patient is already on epinephrine rib, why you keep giving him epinephrine uh, pushes? Simply, 
Epinephrine rib has very small dose of epinephrine compared to the ampoule that we use during the code. This ampoule has one milligram, which means a thousand microgram. We push it right away, right? While the epinephrine rib has, we usually dose it by microgram per kg per minute. So to give that thousand microgram will take hours and hours. So simply stop the epinephrine rib and keep it standby and just rely on the epinephrine ampoule that we use from the code cart. Remember that very well. Okay, now the pulse is back. The patient has spontaneous circulation and the nurse is telling you, oh look, the pressure is 200 systolic blood pressure, 200 over 90, diastolic 90, and the heart rate is 180. Oh, can I give him some labetal or something to low? No, tell her, hold off. Probably this is still the effect of the epinephrine that we've given to this patient. Simply give this patient time and slowly the heart rate will come down as well as the blood pressure. Don't rush to slow it down. Unless the patient is having unstable rhythm, you think the patient is going into ventricular tachycardia and the blood pressure is unstable or SVT and the blood pressure is unstable. But if the blood pressure is too high, heart rate is too high, probably these are the effect of epinephrine. Just give it a little bit of time and the heart rate and blood pressure will come down and probably will be using a levofed drip or norepinephrine drip soon. So don't rush to give medication to slow the heart rate or the blood pressure, please. Sometimes the rhythm is not clear cut on the monitor. You will see this fine fibrillation. You don't know if it's asystole or V-fib. You really don't know. And sometimes you don't know if there is a ventricular tachycardia or a, you know, sign stack with aberrancy, but if you are dealing with the code situation, assume the worst. So assume it's a ventricular fibrillation or pulseless VTAC and just go ahead and shock the patient. So don't assume, no, this is probably PA. If you're not sure if it's a PA or asystole or VFib, assume the worst, assume the things that we could save the patient life with. So I would go ahead, if I have a very even low suspicion that this is ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia, I will go ahead and shock the patient. And sometimes you can simply ask somebody who can help you, hey, what do you think? Is this like really VFIP? So don't be shy of asking help in reading that rhythm as well. So please remember that. The most important thing is to save the patient life. All right, this patient is coding because profusely bleeding, let's say GI bleed. While you're trying to resuscitate the patient, make sure you get blood as soon as possible and pour it in as soon as possible, which means if the patient is not typed and crossed already and have bloods, backed RBCs reserved for him in the blood bank, order O negative blood and immediately to somebody bring it over from the blood bank and infuse it as soon as as possible, as fast as possible while you're trying to resuscitate the patient. Don't wait for the pulse to come back. Say, oh, I'll wait for the pulse to come back to give the blood. No, the patient is pulseless because he's profoundly hypotensive because of this profound anemia, because of this profound bleeding. So you need to give blood while you're trying to resuscitate the patient per the ACLS protocol. Remember that. Okay, nowadays there is no role of bicarb pushes in ACLS protocol. Although they may seem work because they can reverse acidosis temporarily and you get a pulse back for a very short period of time and then you lose the pulse quickly after that once the effect of bicarb wear off. So there is no role of bicarb in the ACLS protocol. Also, there is no role for atropine in pulseless patients. The only role for atropine on those with bradycardia that still has a pulse, we can use atropine. Otherwise, in pulseless patient, there is no role for atropine. During the code, sometimes we send somebody to talk to the family. At any point, if the code status change while we're running the code, just confirm that and follow the family wish. If we're running the code and the family said just stop, we stop. Let's say they, they said stop, 
when you stop the code, call off the code, as we talked last video, check the pulse. If the pulse is back, call the family immediately and tell them that and just see what they want to do. But at any point, just follow the family wishes. They have the right to change the decision even during the code. And actually sometimes if we feel the case is really futile or it took too long and the pulse is not back and we can reach the family and talk to them, that would be also helpful as well. This is a difficult question and there is no consensus on how long we should run the code before stopping. The consensus is the longer the code is, the longer the patient is pulseless, the worse the outcome, the worse the prognosis. It's always helpful to call the family or talk to the family or somebody while you're running the code, somebody's talk to the family because that can save us all that headache. The family may decide to stop or may say keep going. That will be very helpful. But really nobody can tell you, hey, you run it for 20 minutes and that's, that's it, or 30 minutes and that's it. Because if you are trying to resuscitate a nine years old, different, trying to, different from trying to resuscitate a 20 years old, that makes sense, right? So always, if you're thinking the code is going, you think about calling off the code and stopping, ask the people who are running the code or helping you with the code, Ask them if they have any idea. Send somebody, always, always send somebody to talk to the family and try to reach a decision with them. So try to go through these um, scenarios um, and after that, just use your clinical judgment when to call the code off or not. Uh, knowing the patient, knowing the prognosis to start with without before this cardiac arrest, always helpful. But remember, the longer the code, the worse the outcome the worse the prognosis. But I cannot tell you exactly for how long you need to do that. I've done codes for 20 minutes, I've done for 30 minutes, I've done for 45 minutes. And sometimes the patient get the pulse back, lose the pulse, get the pulse back. So all these are factors that will decide for how long we run the code. With this, we come to the end of this video. If you find this information really and this video useful, don't forget to share it with your colleagues. And if you have not subscribed yet, please tap that subscribe button and the notification bell so you get to see our videos as soon as they are released. Thanks for watching.